Now we're going to move to a field scale. And at this uh, scale, this is also located in, in, in Lexington, Illinois, okay? And so what this is, is that we wanted to evaluate a couple scenarios from a nutrient loss reduction strategy. This was being planned while we were also planning the document. So I kind of got ahead. I said, you know, I'm gonna let those guys get their name on a document. I'm gonna go do some work. And uh, we, we got ahead. So nutrient loss reduction strategy, we evaluated number one in that strategy. If you read it, um, they say, hey, if you change the nitrogen uh, application from the fall to spring, we can make a reduction. Number two, they said, okay, if you change the nitrogen from fall to spring and then add cover crops, you make a larger reduction with the idea that these two conservation, nitrogen conservation practices are coupled and additive. Anybody believe that? Possibly, huh? So what about the farmer? This is not in there. This is, this is my practice that we started off studying. What about the farmer that says, I'm really not impressed with fall, spring applied nitrogen. I want to leave a portion of my nitrogen in the fall. And then I'm going to add cover crops. How am I going to do that? Well, I got to strip till and inject green into the cover crop stand. And so we then uh, took that same practice that we started and compared it to the effectiveness here. So show of hands, how many people think that environmentally uh, we're going to reduce the most nitrogen, the higher percent of the nitrogen from re reaching the tile with just moving the nitrogen from fall to spring versus um, adding cover crops. So if you think moving nitrogen from fall to spring is going to reduce more nitrogen than adding cover crops to those two systems, raise your hand. Smart crowd, smart crowd. So in order to in order to evaluate these three scenarios, here are the, here are the treatments we had to uh, install, okay? So here, here again, our zero control, and that's going to shock you. Zero control, no cover crop, no nitrogen, just growing corn and soybean. If we really wanted to be a, a total zero control, we would grow what's native to this region, which is what? Prairie. But the farmer was not going for that. <laughs> he was like, I'm going to get something out of the zero control, guy dog it. So I said, okay. So he grew corn and soybeans, but no nitrogen, no cover crop. Then the next two treatments is a spring dominated. It's a split where we put 80% down uh, in the spring, no inserve. 80% down in the spring, and then 20% in the fall with DAP, with and without cover crops. The next two uh, split is fall dominated, 70% down in the fall with anhydrous and DAP, 30% in the spring with no, with, we had in here, no in here in the spring. No in here in the spring, okay, with, with the 30%, and we did that with and without cover crops. All fields receive uh, about 200 pounds per acre, which is close to the MRTN uh, recommended rate, according to U of I, and uh, all of the anhydrous where you had cover crops were strip-tilled into cereal rye radish mix, okay? So here's what the field looks like. So when we got there, this farmer was about eight to 10 years of strip till before corn, no till before soybean. He was also already doing a good soil conservation job with minimal till there. Then uh, he, was, he was also, 60% of his nitrogen was in the fall, 40% was in the spring. And what you see here is uh, very expensive tile work. <laughs> Okay, so um, each one of these blue uh, boxes represents a field that's about 6.5 or 6.6 .6 acres, which consists of about seven, 72 rows of crops on 30 inch uh, centers. These red lines represent uh, tile laterals that are about 45 feet apart. Okay, and this yellow box is a tile monitoring station where we tap into the water that's leaving each one of those fields. So each one of those five treatments are replicated randomly five times, uh, I mean three times throughout these 15 individually tiled plots. So we we're able to, to, to do a good job of figuring out how the treatment is affecting the water, how the treatment is affecting, you know, the growth and so forth. So this is what, this is that yellow dot. This is what it looks like. It's a control structure that looks like this. You're probably familiar with that. We tap into this water. We use this to slow it down. We tap into the water. Okay, and we have in this weatherproof box, 
the brains of the system, which is the communication and data storage. Uh, it's the power is coming from a solar uh, panel, and this is the automated sampler. This, is re this replaces a human from sticking a cup in the towel and then sampling. So it, it does it by itself. And then it texts my graduate students and says, hey, come out here and refill me, you know, because I'm ready to take some more samples. It never comes to me. I made sure of that. <laughs> All right. So to, to, to get farmers respect, we said we're not going out there and hand cranking uh, cover crops. We're not going to do it. We're going to do this like the farmer would do it. So we hired SNS out of Sleater, and they were gracious enough to come and contract with me, and uh, they retrofitted their, their Hagee to drop cover crop seeds into a living stand early, mid to, early to mid September. Uh, we were watching him very closely. So I was in the cab with a walkie-talkie. My graduate students were walking in front of this thing <laughs> and beside it, okay, because we have a lot of equipment. Each one of those yellow dots is $15,000, okay? So we were making sure, and man, he was so smooth. He would come out the field, turn and raise this wing up, swing, turn and go back in the field. I was scared to death, but, <laughs> but he was really smooth with it. He knocked down less than 1% of the biomass that was standing. He was able to do that and knock down less than 1%. So you can see him going through our alleyways. This is what it looks like, um, some of the growth up, up close. So this is September 2014. This is December. Uh, December 15, what it looks like. This is a mixture of cereal rye and radish. That's all we had. I wanted to show this slide because this is farmer innovative uh, innovation. This, this farmer was, he's a young farmer, um, and he's really all about his data, okay, and his precision ag. And so uh, he said, you know what? The cover crops begin to grow over the slit, uh, the, the injection of the nitrogen, the strip of the strip till, right? So, so he strip tilled right into that. Here's the residue. He came back and used his guidance to put his seed right into the, where the strip of nitrogen is where the cover crop was growing. So you got three layers of system going on in this, residue, and he did that every year for two years so far. So this was into, this is when we went 2014 corn, 2015 corn, 2016 soybeans. This is going into, you know, corn residue, and this is what it looks like when you're going into, this is this year, this fall, what it looks like when you strip till into soybean residue with the cover crop growing, okay? Um, and so he's going to come back and use his equipment to hit that growth that, that strip and plant his seed. Okay, so uh, here's the uptake over two years. A lot of numbers, and I know I forgot to convert it from, from kilograms per acre to pounds per acre, but, but we do have something in pounds per acre here. So this is the first cover crop growing season. This is the fall, this is the spring, 14, 15, and 15, 16 fall and spring. So if you look here, you notice uh, that the biomass is quite different from fall to spring. And the uptake uh, is mismirroring the, the biomass, and it's quite different from fall to spring. Um, and this, this difference represents the impact of cereal Because what, if I have a, a cereal radish mixture, what's not growing in the spring? The radish. So we went from, let's say right here, from 9.7 uh, kilograms per hectare to 40 because the radish decomposed, the cereal probably interacted with some of that radish residue, uh, residue nitrogen, and then some of the nitrogen from the soil and kept growing, kept scavenging. So this is the difference in biomass and uptake. Now, you don't see that difference in the second year, 15 to 16. Why is that? Why do you think? What was this fall like? 2015 fall. It was hot. It was warm. Abnormally warm. So a lot of that growing occurred. You can see the difference in biomass is also little. A lot of that growing occurred in the fall. A lot of the uptake occurred in the fall. So then when it warmed up in the spring, it was like, I'm kind of running out of gas because I did a lot of work in the fall. Right? I thought that was neat to see how the climate, the weather, can dictate the growth and the, the scavenging ability of the cover crop. So overall, you're looking at about... 50 pounds per acre on average scavenged. There was not a difference 
in, uh, so, so, you know, in the spring plots, you didn't get the fall injection, although you got the strip. But in the fall plots, you got the fall injection into the cover crops. There's not a big difference between the two that lets me know uh, that, that that made a huge difference in the growth. Overall, when you think about it, your cover crops have the ability to interact with about 25% of what you apply. We applied 200 uh, pounds, and here's 50 pounds that we found in the residue. One neat factor, so the ratio here of cereal rye to radish is 8% radish, 92% cereal rye. But the radish represented 55% of the biomass and 51% of the uptake of nitrogen. That means a little bit of radish goes a what? A long ways, right? And it only grows in the fall. Let's fast forward and think about how does the cover crop interact the volume of water that leaves the field through the tile drainage? And when does that impact occur? What we have here is discharge in millimeters, all right? And on this x-axis, we have 2014 cover crop growing season, 15 corn season, 15 cover crop season, 2016 um, soybean season, okay? So when is the cover crop making its impact on the discharge of water leaving the system? When it's growing. The green bars, cover crop um, treatments, okay? These bars that are not green are non-cover crop treatments. You see differences here, nothing here. Differences here when it's growing, nothing here. So one question is, is how much of this reduction of water drainage is contributing to the reduction in nitrogen? Could be huge. We're trying to figure that out. All right, so this is, looks like a complicated graph, but it's not. This is total nitrate loss in pounds per acre, okay? These uh, hollow bars are cumulative rainfall, so about 55, so far from 10 to 14 to 11, 15, uh, 2016, uh, we recorded uh, right at 55 inches of rainfall that hit that experiment, okay? During that time, the treatments lost uh, quite different amount of nitrogen through the tile. The green represents the cover crop treatments. Uh, this is spring. This is, uh, man. This is, this is spring without cover crops, fall without cover crops, spring with cover crops, fall with cover crops. What do you see? It's, it's a game changer. Environmentally, it's a game changer. Let's look at it. Spring, so remember we were looking at what happens if I move my nitrogen from the fall to the spring. Well, actually, this might not be significantly different, but the spring actually um, lost 15% more than the fall. So we'll, we'll call that equal. When you add cover crops to that spring nitrogen, you reduce that loss by 45%. You add cover crops to fall nitrogen, uh, you reduce that loss by 41%. When you look at moving the nitrogen to the, to the spring, but I'm not gonna pay for cover crops, I keep my nitrogen in the fall and I do adopt cover crops, 49% reduction in what's leaving the field through the tile. When you look at spring plus cover crops versus fall plus cover crops, it's only 7% re uh, reduction or difference so we're going to call that about equal. Cover crops, when they're growing, make a huge impact. Now, what's this red line doing? That's the zero control. Can anybody believe that data? Why? Why? That's what I do to my students. Why? <laughs> Why? Like a five-year-old. Why? <laughs> it's exposed. It's exposed. No, no, no. This received no nitrogen. That red line received no nitrogen, no cover crop, just corn and soybean. Why is it losing the most? You got a high organic matter soil that's still mineralizing nitrogen all through the year. One? Very good. I couldn't have said it better. What else is happening? Runoff. Runoff? Yeah, you got volume of water moving through the tile. 
But why is that? Why, 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 you, you have, why are you getting a loss? You got the organic matter mineralizing, releasing nitrogen into solution. What's taking it up? Nothing. A weak growing corn plant and, 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 and then the soybeans. Nothing is really putting a demand on that nitrogen. So watch this. What does that tell farmers? That means that I have a lot of nitrogen that I should be taking advantage of. Because even when I don't apply any, I'm losing the same as if I applied 200 units. What am I going to use to tap into that nitrogen? Bioreactor. Mm -mm. Wetland. Mm -mm. No. Why? Because they operate by denitrification, meaning that the nitrogen goes into a system, they, they, they reduce the oxygen in the system, the microbes that can live with no oxygen interacts with that nitrogen, converts it to a gas, and it leaves into the atmosphere. Corn plant cannot take nitrogen from the atmosphere. So that's why cover crops are so important, because cover crops are going to interact with that nitrogen and keep it in the field. Okay? So let's look at, let's analyze the residual nitrogen effect. And how does moving the nitrogen to the spring versus leaving it in the fall affect the residual nitrogen? The nitrogen that was applied in the corn, in the corn year, but we see it come out the tile in the soybean year. That's the residual that I'm speaking of. So in the spring system, this is what was lost in the corn year. And we, right at V6, we side dress, and this is what was lost upwards to this number in the, this is what was lost in the, the soybean year. You add cover crops to that same system, a little bit different during the, during the corn year, but then look at that difference there, right? You go to fall, about even, okay? Uh, lost in, during the, so more of that nitrogen is lost during the corn year. And this year, in 2015, we had a record rainfall in what? June and not too far behind in July, okay? So you can expect uh, that to, to occur. And then, but in the soybean year, because so much was lost here, you're not losing as much here. But then when you add cover crops to this system, what's happening? This reduction, 64% reduction of residual nitrogen that's leaving the system. This reduction, 57%. So you're averaging about, you know, 53 or so percent reduction in residual nitrogen that, that escapes us when you add cover crops to the systems. You can still see the zero control is dominating. Okay? So when is this impact happening? The same time uh, that the impact on the discharge is happening. During the cover crop season, you're seeing reductions. But when you don't have cover crops growing, you're not seeing the reduction so much. Now, one thing that's interesting here, when you go from cover crops into corn and you have a nitrogen application either before or in between, you have less chance of making an impact, uh, a residual impact of that cover crop in the cash crop growing season. But when you go from cover crops dominating during the corn, uh, before soybeans, right, and really taking up a lot of that residual nitrogen that came from the corn year, that affect, this, there's some residual of that, of that effect that goes into the soybean year. Why? because there's no nitrogen applied. So you were asking the question, should we cover crop before each cash crop? Yes, 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 yes. We should think about that. You saw the nitrogen that's in this higher matter soil. Uh, what does, what, what, if, I'm, if I'm a crimson clover and I see all of this nitrogen in the soil, am I gonna allow the bacteria to infect me and create uh, a nodule? No. Why? Why would I do that? I don't need to, right? You really don't get the impact of the legumes unless you're coming behind wheat. How much wheat do we have in Illinois? Exactly. All right. So let's, let's continue forward. So this is the impact of yield, and I am sorry that this is in megagrams per hectare, but I can tell you the range was about 205 to 2. To 215 or so. Okay? But let's look at the trend. Now, I wondered about this zero control because I'm saying to myself, maybe I'm contaminating this thing with the nitrogen that's applied. But if I was contaminating, then my yield would be what? Greater. 
the uptake looks the same. So that means that this zero control is valid. What we're seeing in loss is valid. It's not bleeding over from other places. If it was, your coin would respond to it and grab it and use it, but it's not, right? When you look at the spring system, okay, um, spring cover crops slightly reduced, significantly according to this, but biologically slightly, reduced um, the, the yield of, of the corn. When you look at the fall system, there's no different in with fall with or without cover crops, and they're both equal to the spring system. Now, I think that me and Sean could have worked together <laughs> and, and got over this hurdle, because I'm sure he would have told me, Shalomar, you had corn in 2014. You got a heavy cereal inclusion mix uh, in the fall, and then you're going back corn in 2015. I need what with that at planting? What do I need at planting? Say it loud. I need what? Starter. I need starter. I didn't put starter. I paid for it. Okay? Now, th let's think about this. What we're seeing in the data, we're still trying to, trying to pick this out. We know we had a, a flush in June and a flush in July. Um, and really, up front, and this is puzzling me, and I'm, I'm going to figure this out before I come back next year, but up front, we're seeing that the cover crops during that flush of nitrogen is, is compensating for the nitrogen that was uh, lost from the system because it was releasing nitrogen from its residue. So then nitrogen uptake for corn plants that were in cover crop systems were higher than uh, nitrogen uptake for spring and uh, fall uh, corn plants that didn't have cover crops within them. Okay, when I say uh, and so what am I talking about? I'm talking about V6, and I'm talking about um, VT, okay, right at tasseling. Uptake was greater here. But after that, something is occurring, and then when we close out, and that plant is trying to finish out at R6 relative maturity, we have less uptake. It reversed on us. Now, you know, we have a team that's trying to figure that out, trying to figure out what's happening. We, we definitely, we don't know. Could it be that we need, you know, to take advantage of the technology where we can apply nitrogen late in the growing season, where we have cover crops, just as much as we need starter? Am I saying apply more nitrogen? No. I'm saying take the, your portions and be more systematic and apply it at greater than two applications. And that could feed that plant, kind of food, spoon feed that plant, because the cover crop is scavenging and really, we can't control when it releases. It releases based on environmental conditions. But we did find what was positive is that when everything else was flushed and starving, corn that was in the cover crop plots were thriving. But then later on, we just didn't have enough to finish off. And luckily, we, we were able to get the same yield here, but then we, we had a slight reduction here. Now, I think that starter fertilizer could have changed the whole game. Late season could have changed the game. Those are the things that, so we're taking this and we develop new questions, and that gives me job security, so I go and do more research, and I come back and talk to you guys, right? So summary, I think you got this already. Um, cover crops was able to stabilize or scavenge about 50 pounds per acre. Um, you know, a range of reduction when you add cover crops to a system, despite whether, the fall, whether it's fall applied or spring applied nitrogen, 41 to 49 percent reduction. Residual nitrogen in that soybean year, on average, about 53 percent reduction in what you're losing. Cover crops are most effective when they're growing. Um, cover crops slightly reduce uptake, uh, slightly reduce yield in the spring system, but not in the fall system. Um, cover crop did not impact soybean yield. <laughs>